Good morning, everyone. Stand with us as we begin today. Welcome back to church. Those of you on Facebook Live, we, we thank you for joining us as well. And, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And then after that, find somebody you don't know and give them a big Bear Creek hug. Make sure you welcome them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for giving us this place to come in and worship you, sing praises to you, hear your preached word, Lord. It's a special place. And we're just glad that our lives are such that we can take this small time out and give you the honor and the praise that you really do deserve. And you deserve much more than anything that we have to give, but we're here to give you what we have, Lord. All that we have, we give it to you at this time. And we thank you again. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Now visit somebody, give them a Bear Creek hug. Shepherd, a 
calling you all of my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make way. Walk me through the valley, but you never steered me wrong. So lean on, good shepherd. Some mighty deep canyons that you brought me through. I've seen some mighty big mountains that just up and move. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Yeah, that's my song. I'm walking with my father into the great unknown. Follow you all of my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lean on, good shepherd, lean on. Step by step, step by step, day by day, lead me on. Lord, I pray the road gets dark. We walk by faith. Lean on, good shepherd. Oh, lean on day by day. Lead me on, Lord, I pray the road gets dark. We walk by faith. Lean on, good shepherd. Oh, step by step, day by day. Lead me on, Lord, I pray. The road gets dark, we walk by faith. Lean on, good shepherd. Lean on, good shepherd. I'll follow you all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lean on, good shepherd, lean on. Step by step, step by step, day by day. Lead me on, Lord, I pray. The road gets dark, we walk by faith. Lean on, good shepherd, step by step, day by day. Lead me on, Lord, I pray. The road gets dark. We walk by faith. Lean on, good shepherd. Lean on, good shepherd. I'll follow you all of my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steered me wrong. So lean on, good shepherd. Lean on, good shepherd. Lean on, good shepherd. Lord, and lean on, good shepherd. Lean on, good shepherd. Lean on. Amen. 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 You're going to get a testimony whether you're ready or not. You hear me? Somebody want to give a testimony to Jesus? You know what? All of what's going on in this crazy world, right, of war, of hatred, of dissension, mm -hmm. sometimes we, we kind of lose the fact that God is still in control, that the battle that we're in, it's already been won. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? We can claim that today. If you're here today and you've been battling, remember the one who's already won. Amen? Darkness. Hope 
it's in the blood There's a future grace that's mine today That Jesus Christ has won Hallelujah So I can face tomorrow Cause tomorrow's in your hands And all I need you will chapter we know. we know what's going to happen sing it out i know how the storm is we will be with you again you're my savior my friend no more fear No more fear in life or death. 
That's in front of me.
Let's bow our hands to go into prayer. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this moment, Father God, where we could just come and praise you and meet with you, Lord, where we're at, Lord. You know what we're facing. You know what we're going through. You know what our loved ones are going through. Lord, help us to understand this season in life that we're at today, Father God. And today when we hear your good news, Lord, I pray that we have hope in you. Your word is true. Your word speaks life. And you are a miracle worker, no matter what we're facing, Father God. So today, Father God, as we hear your word, and we need to confess, Father God, may this be the time and the place that we do, Father God. And may we surrender to you, Father God, because although the world is in a dark place as we speak, Father God, you have power, you have authority, you know what tomorrow is going to bring. And it is you, Lord, that we come with trust and faith that you are going to move mountains and many are going to bow down to you, Father God. So today, no matter what we're facing, you already know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I pray that my sisters and my brothers and myself have hope in you. Come, Lord. Come and move mountains in our life and speak to us in a profound way that we know that it's you, Father God. We love you. We adore you because you are powerful. And we are going to see mighty things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. And all his people said, amen. everyone. Today we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 39. So you want to go ahead and open up there. So far we've been seeing how Luke has force pointed out how we should recognize who Jesus is as the Son of God through his birth and the announcement of his coming and how even the devil and demons recognized who he was. And now as we're going through it, we're going to see how he presents himself to the rest of the people and to those who should be able to recognize him the most, those religious leaders. So we'll go ahead and start in verse 17. It says, On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and let him down with his bed through the towels into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been laying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. 
And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them this parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new. For he says, the old is good. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father God, we just pray that we have an open heart and an open mind to understand what it is you're trying to tell us and that we receive it in our hearts and take it with us. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So going back to Jesus heals the paralytic man. On one of those days, as he was teaching, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Some manuscript says to heal them. Luke is pointing out that them is the Pharisees and the teachers who had come from far away. The news of what Jesus was doing had spread so quickly and was so impactful that these Pharisees and teachers from all over had come to see for themselves what he was doing. Jesus read Isaiah's prophecy in the temple and let him know it was fulfilled in him now. He has gone outside of the temple and began to teach and gained a following. His, this had to be very concerning to them. So we have the UC and the college here. Imagine one day a man shows up and starts teaching in a more practical way that makes more sense, and the pre professors realize students aren't showing up to class anymore because they're going to listen to this man. They will probably wonder what's going on and go check for themselves what's going on. And what if they realized he wasn't just giving them information, he was transforming their lives on the spot? They would panic. They might fear they would lose their job. But what about if all he was doing in changing lives was so those professors would pay attention outside of the system? They are locked into and see that they could have a better way for themselves and those they teach. What if he was leading by example? The power of the Lord was present to heal them, the Pharisees and the teachers. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. Luke is saying, wait, something else is happening at the same time. The power of the Lord is present, but there's an interruption. The roof is torn apart, and this man is being brought to Jesus in desperation for healing. Imagine our roof starts getting torn apart right now. Steve would start running the numbers of how much it would cost to repair it. We might go into panic looking for security. Yeah. See, there's two groups seeking Jesus, one noticeably needing healing. Everyone is seeking God at some point, 
in their life. But because they need a life-changing experience, someone got, some want God to make a change in someone else's life. Some want to understand what's going on. Some are just curious about why others believe. And some are trying to affirm their, their disbelief. And when, he was, and when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribe and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? We have to help people as much as we can, but we can all reach a limit and realize only God can finish the work. These men did all they could to help, but they were not able to heal the paralytic man. So they brought him to the one they believed could. It can be hard trying to help someone in need and realizing there is a point where you can, can't do anymore. That's when faith is tested. Jay shared his story last week of how his son was coming out of surgery and the panic of him not being able to breathe and just having that message of pray. At the same moment, I was working on this sermon, reading these same passages, and I had to realize that we were coming along like those men, bringing that situation to God in prayer. But even in that moment, there's that doubt of, what if he's not healed? I think we all have that, that happen in our lives when we're praying for somebody. We're so hopeful, but we know it's out of our control. And we want healing for somebody else for so many reasons, but we just don't know if it will happen. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the healing we want is not the healing that Jesus gives. Jesus didn't heal the man physically. He recognized the desperate man's internal faith expressed through the outward action, and first he healed the paralytic's internal need. Even though it was obvious they wanted the man to be healed externally. In the same way God knows the help we are trying to offer and the healing someone actually needs. And most likely it starts internally. Most of us probably didn't believe because we were externally healed, but because we were healed internally. Our hearts and minds had to change first. The Pharisees question what Jesus has done and at the same time bring to light who he really is. They believe God can forgive sins, but have no way of proving it. With all their legalism and knowledge, the best they can do is believe God forgives sins on the Day of, to of Atonement by the sacrifice made in the temple. How could Jesus do this in a random home? How dare he try to do what not even the priests can do in the temple? They were the facilitators of the sacrifice ceremony, but it was God who forgave sins. Who has ever questioned how God works? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? Just like Jesus knew the internal healing the man needed and the internal faith of the men who carried him, he knew what they were thinking. We can be like the Pharisees asking, how do we know this is really God? We need proof. Jesus is asking what level of proof they or we need to recognize he is God. He already knows what is inside of us, but are we able to recognize him and his abilities? Which is easier to say? I could come up here like Oprah and say, your sins are healed, your sins are healed, your sins are healed, your sins are healed, all oh, your sins are healed. I don't have a car. Best I could do is your sins. But you wouldn't know if it's true. It's not seen.
Both are easy to say, but only the word of God has the authority to make both possible. If I told Miss Mary, chuck your walker and walk home, she'd look at me crazy and be like, it's not happening, it's not. I could say it, but it doesn't make it happen. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. In Jesus forgiving his sin, it would be enough for his salvation, but so that all may believe he is God Jesus also physically heals the man. The way God does things is not only so that we may be healed, but rather so that we or those around us may believe in God and his power. Jesus doesn't just call himself God without giving proof. We may seek physical healing for others, but unless it is meant for God's glory, it may not happen. But in faith, we must bring it to him and let his will be done. Understanding that forgiveness of sin may be the only response if there is a response at all. Hopefully, we have enough faith to carry them there. Jesus here identifies himself in a way they should recognize his power and authority. If we take a look at Daniel chapter 7, Verse 13 through 14, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, God, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. If the Pharisees believed that only God had the authority and ability to forgive sins and heal in the miraculous way, and all of the authority was given to the one like the Son of Man, Daniel prophesies about, it should be undeniable to them that Jesus was the Messiah the one like a son of man. The man who was healed and those who witnessed recognizing the power of God in their presence glorified him. But we will see how the Pharisees and the teachers were not convinced. We continue as Jesus calls Levi. Says, After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Levi, the tax collector, is better known as the apostle Matthew. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, says that Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And he continues in chapter 10, verse through, 2 through 4, says, The name of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. See, Levi is a Hebrew name, which means joined. Matthew is a Greek name, which means the gift of God. Luke will also later use the name Matthew when listing the apostles' names. And even though he is called by different names, 
He is connected in different scriptures by, by the time, location, and career he held. The name change also showing a change from who he was before and after Jesus called him to follow. As we go back to verse 29, it says, And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him, with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Tax collectors were pretty much hated because they took advantage of their people. The Romans had instituted taxes that had to be paid, but the tax collectors were able to keep for themselves any additional taxes they received. They were hated so much they were seen as equals to sinners and unwanted in society, even the temple. Levi, or Matthew, was obviously guilty of this, as we see he was able to host a large gathering for, of affluent people. Others who likely also gained position and power by taking advantage of others. But the Pharisees and the scribes were also there. Makes you wonder how much they rubbed elbows before, or were they just crashing the party? Levi also recognized the authority of Jesus. As a tax collector, he would have been very aware of all the things going on in his area. He would have likely been aware of what Jesus was doing. When called, he didn't say, wait until my shift is over or let me gather what is owed for the day before following him. He dropped everything, quitting on the spot. And Jesus must have led him back home so they may have this celebration. In the past, 22 years or so, I've left two jobs behind out of three jobs that I've had. The first one, I was working a closing shift at Carl's Jr. And now throughout the day, I was just getting this feeling of, I can't be here anymore. Like, this is the end. I shouldn't be back here tomorrow. So at the end of the shift, I left my shirt, my name tag, and my hat in the manager's office. My brother was the shift lead, so it didn't go too well for him, but <laughs> I just wasn't meant to be there anymore. Just felt that calling to move on. I didn't have another job. I didn't know what was going to be next. For two weeks, I just waited for the next opportunity. And it came up that where my mom worked, they needed somebody else. So I went in thinking it was going to be a part-time job or seasonal job. Turned out to be 20 years that I worked there, oftentimes not wanting to be there until I got that calling again of it's time to move on. Again, not knowing what was going to be next, I gave my notice and it actually took about a year before I finally left. But in both situations, I was paralyzed by the fear of one, not knowing what was next, and two, how was I going to provide? By the second time, I had a family of six that I had to take care of and was the sole provider for. But that's where faith comes in, of being able to trust in God. And that's what Levi or Matthew was doing here. He didn't say, wait, let me see, let me line things up before I go. He dropped everything. There was no job to go back to. He was just going to follow Jesus wherever he led him. In the same way, that's the faith we got to have when we're being called to something. We hear that calling, just got to go. It's like, it might be scary. Most things are, but we just got to move on when we hear that calling. And you'll know it's him because you won't want to do it. <laughs> but the Pharisees don't see this transformation. They are judging by the people's past. Their vision is cloudy and they can't see beyond their own righteousness. How could the one who just showed them he is God in human form possibly be hanging out with the worst people they can think of? Have we ever made ourselves feel so righteous that we can decide who God should help? Why would God associate with people we don't want to be seen with? 
And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is clear about his purpose. He came to heal sin. Jesus is often the great physician because of verse 31. It says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But we have been using it wrong. We call him the great physician in prayer for physical healing, but that is not what the verse is about. Like the paralytic, we need healing from sin first. Physical healing is a bonus. God is very capable of healing us physically, and it may come at some point if it brings him glory. But Jesus was sent so we could be forgiven and live a life of repentance. When we pray for physical healing, we should also pray for spiritual healing, for forgiveness of sins and a life of repentance. Like the man who carried the paralytic, we may not know the extent of a person's need, but Jesus does. And we should bring it all to him in faith that he will heal what is necessary, even though sometimes it will not look like the healing we hoped for. Jesus keeps asking these Pharisees to examine their heart and actions without saying it directly. He is being a physician in diagnosing their condition. He is the ER doctor in a waiting room full of sinners. They judge while Levi celebrates that his life has changed. He left his position, which would not be available for him to return to. Someone else would take that position, and he would be leaving his home and these people to follow Jesus. Repentance is what led to the physical change of Levi. We don't read his sins being forgiven, but he acts as if they were. He changes his ways and follows Jesus. When we are healed internally, we express it ex externally. And what do the Pharisees do? Admit that they are sinners in need of healing? No. They appeal to their righteousness. We go back to verse 33. It says, and they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer, offer prayers, and so do to the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The Jewish people were only required to fast once a year on the Day of Atonement. If you take a look at Leviticus chapter 23, Verse 26 through 27, verse 31, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement, it shall be for you a time of holy conviction, and you shall afflict yourself, or shall fast, and present a food offering to the Lord. You shall not do any work. It is a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. The religious leaders had added on more days of fasting throughout the year and weekly, often making themselves appear to be suffering in their fast to be noticed. But Jesus reminds them fasting isn't for their own praise or recognition. There is appropriate times for fasting. And while Jesus is present, it was not the time for fasting and mourning. It was a time for celebration. And again, he reminds them who he is through the words of the prophet Isaiah. If we look at Isaiah 61, verses 10 and 11, he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe, robe of righteousness. 
as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout out, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. Isaiah 61 was the scroll Jesus read from in the temple a few weeks ago. Letting those in attendance know he was the one Isaiah wrote about and the fulfillment of the prophecy of his first coming. Here we see a later part of that scroll where it describes Jesus as the bridegroom and his righteousness. Jesus is preparing for his union with the future church. And this is a cause for joy and celebration. These sinners are doing more to honor the Messiah than the Pharisees. If anyone has the right to appeal to righteousness, it is Jesus. Again, this scripture is often used by people to describe themselves or the church as being clothed with salvation or righteousness. But they are not placed on either directly. They come from being in a union with the bridegroom, Jesus. Instead of thinking of Jesus that was disrobed, beaten, and nailed to the cross, we can think of Jesus that showed up to marry his church, dressed in salvation and righteousness. Jesus showed up ready for what he was going to do. And if you wonder if this is correct, Isaiah also tells how Jesus will be dressed for his second coming. In Isaiah 59, verse 16 through 17, he, God, saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm, Jesus, brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Isaiah 61 shows Jesus dressed for an occasion of celebration. Isaiah 59 shows him dressed for an occasion of battle. Jesus wants to know if they're going to continue to disfigure themselves with sour and sad faces, doing fasts that are not necessary, or are they going to be a part of the celebration, being in the presence of the Messiah? The time for fasting and mourning his loss would come. He continues in verse 35. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Fasting, even if not required, has its place in time. There are situations that require us to get closer to God by eliminating food or distractions, a time when we focus on our dependency of him. He also told them this parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. I don't know, a few of you have probably patched up some clothes in the past and know that if you take an old piece of clothing and a new piece of clothing, they're going to shrink at different rates. You're likely to ruin the new. Instead of making it better, you just made it worse. But Levi was not adding following Jesus to his life. He is doing something new, leaving the old behind. He is placing Jesus in his new life. He is showing true repentance, having a change of mind, which leads to a change of action. In the same way, Jesus' death on the cross would not add to the law being followed by the Pharisees or the box they were trying to make him fit into. Jesus came to start a new system of forgiveness that would complete the promises God had made. Jesus says they are cut from a different cloth. In Jeremiah verse 31, or chapter 31, verse 31 and 33, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The time for this new covenant was then. Paul confirms it in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, as he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in, in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus is setting himself apart from their expectations for the benefit of all who will have faith in him. The law made us aware of sin, but it could not save us from it. Jesus did. Again, walking in the Spirit is showing repentance from our sinful nature. Jesus continues in verse 37. And no one puts, on, puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst, and the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. Just like the garments being patched, they would use new wineskins for new wine because the wine would ferment causing the skins to expand. If they had put the new wine into an old wineskin that had already been stretched to its max, then it would break. The skin would be ruined and the wine would be wasted. So he says, but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. These wineskins are a description of the people the old being people like the Pharisees and the scribes who are not open to expanding their minds and hearts to the possibility of Jesus as the Messiah or accepting his teaching and message of salvation, not from captivity and oppression, but from sin. The new being all who will receive him, his teaching, his forgiveness, and his healing. Are you flexible and willing to be stretched out to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? Jesus came to do a new work. He had to pour new wine into new skins. This led to the formation of a new church. Paul says it this way in Galatians 2.16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. And Jesus continues, verse 39, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good, or some versions say the old is better. I think most know that older wine is considered to be better, but not in this case. Jesus, knowing their hearts and minds, finishes by describing their faith. They are married to their traditions and believe the old way is the best way. They are not open to trying something new. They are stubborn and stuck in their ways. Even when all evidence points to a new and better way, they cannot see or receive it. Which leads to the questions, how stuck in your old ways are we? 
What traditions or habits keep us from recognizing the work of Jesus in our life? We have seen three seemingly different stories, but they're all connected by the same interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees and the lessons that they miss. First, the forgiveness of sins is the priority of Jesus. He has in every person's life. No matter our physical condition, circumstances, past or future, he comes to the ones who recognize they need a savior. In the same way, it should be our first priority in helping others. Whether it be through physically trying to help someone get to a place they can believe in Jesus, or we faithfully pray for their salvation, like the men who carry the paralytic, we must faithfully do what is within our power and trust Jesus will finish the work. Two, with forgiveness of sin comes repentance, a changing of the mind and a change in our actions. The paralytic man and Levi both listened to the commands of Jesus and went on to live different lives. And three, be open to new possibilities being led by the Spirit. The Pharisees were stuck in their ways to see forgiveness being possible through Jesus or even open to the possibility of salvation through any way but obedience of the law. They didn't see themselves having to do anything different. Right now there's a war between Israel and Gaza and Hamas and a lot of it has to do over them both believing they're right and both believing they have claim to the same land. This is very much a battle that has been going on for many, many years and will likely continue because they are both stuck to their beliefs. They both believe they are right and they both believe they have claim to a promise. But Jesus came to do more than just that promise. He came so that we would all be forgiven. Not so we could claim the land here, but so we would have a better place to go to. So we have a choice to make. Are we going to have faith like the men on the roof that all things are possible through Jesus? Are we willing to recognize we're all terminally ill through sin? Are we willing to accept it is only through Jesus that our sin is forgiven? Are we going to show repentance in response to salvation through Jesus? Are we going to celebrate our salvation or continue to mourn living in the past? If you answered yes to these questions for the first time or the 10,000th time, and are ready to celebrate, Jesus gave us a way. Just like Levi shared a meal, he's also given us a meal. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He says it in 1 Corinthians. Jesus celebrated with the ones he called while he was with them. And he celebrated just before he went to the cross. And he left us a celebration to remember his sacrifice, his completion of his first priority, to heal us from sin, so we could walk in a new life. If I could have the couples that are going to do communion and the worship team come up, we'll go ahead and pray. Oh. Father God, we just give you thanks for sending Jesus to heal us first from sin and then for any other, other afflictions or physical conditions we may have. We just pray that we can be grateful that you did the most important part, the part we could not see. We pray that we can recognize the healing in our lives and in others. And we pray that we can help guide them to this same kind of healing 
and that they can understand that the most important part is salvation from their sins. And we just pray for peace and open-mindedness that we can all receive you in our hearts and continue to walk in repentance until the day you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The table is open. Amen.
Good morning, Bear Creek. Hey, we just want to get you guys updated. There is so much going on around here. So just to let you guys know how you can get plugged in throughout the week, um, Monday through Thursday at 5.30 p.m., we have Faith and Fitness. So we have our gym in the back, and it's just a time of growing together uh, spiritually and physically. So 5.30, Monday through Thursday. Tuesday nights, we have Chain Breakers at 7 p.m. That is for anybody who is struggling with addiction or you just want to come alongside other people who are struggling with addiction. Maybe God's given you victory in that area, and you're able to pour back into somebody else. Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, Wednesday night, this Wednesday night at 6.30, we're going to have a night of prayer right here in the sanctuary, so you can come, come get involved in that. Thursday nights, we have a rooted group growing on at 6.30, and so that's just our standing weekly stuff that's going on, but this week, uh, we want to talk about some other stuff because next Sunday, we're going to have baptism here. We have a few people, several people that God is just at work in their life, and they want to take that step of obedience and just proclaim to the world that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, and they're identifying publicly with him. So next Sunday after service, we're going to have baptism for several people. So stay, uh, join us for that. It's just an amazing day. I remember February 13th, 2005, the night I got baptized, and it's just an, an amazing part of your, your journey. If you haven't done that yet, there is a sign-up out front. Uh, please sign up so I can get a hold of you this week and just talk about what that means. But next Sunday after service, we're going to have that. Immediately after service today, we're going to have a meeting. Uh, this is Bear Creek Community Church, and we love to serve our community. And so once again this year, we're going to have our drive through Thanksgiving. And so we just want to have a meeting to talk about uh, ways to volunteer and, and be involved in that. So we've done this a few times. I think last time we served about 800 people, 800 or so meals to the community. Everybody can just drive through, pick up some food, and it's just an amazing day. And, and this is our way. We always talk about you know, finding your place on Team Jesus. How do we get involved? How do we join in what God is doing? And so this is our way to give back. So immediately after service today, there's several different ways you can help out. So prepping the food, um, we need runners to take the food out, and then we offer prayer for every car that drives through the, the parking lot. If they want to pray, we have a team of people that's available to pray for them. So think about, pray about right now how you can help out with that, but we're going to talk about that um, immediately after service today. And we have another like family fun day coming up on November 5th, so we'll have more details as we plan that out. Um, it's going to be just a meal celebrating all of us and the, all the different ministries going around here and some games and stuff for the kids to have a family day. So um, other than that, we are also going to have a membership class coming up. There is a sign-up sheet in the front. We're going to do that in the next couple weeks or so here. We're going to get the date nailed down, but I just wanted to let you guys know there is a sign-up sheet out in the front for if you want to like to join and become a member here at Bear Creek. So lots of stuff going on. We just wanted to give you an update, and thank you for being here. Bless you, brother. Also, um, not in your announcement sheet, but something that's going on tonight at Central Pres, uh, Central Presbyterian Church in downtown Merced. Uh, it's going to be what's called a gospel sing. And about 15 or 20 churches that are going to be coming and bringing groups, they've asked me to direct the uh, pastor's choir. So that's already scary for me personally. But anyway, you're welcome to come to that. That time, It starts tonight at 6 o'clock if you'd like to join uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of churches from all over the valley there. It should be fun. <clears throat> the Lord bless you as you give today. Um, <clears throat> you know, when the sun has set you free, you are free indeed. Amen. Darkness 
free indeed to share the good news of the gospel, one of which is you are love. Take God with you today.